For more than 40 years, News 8, Charleston's news leader. The aftermath of days of flooding leaves many going over their losses. People in the worst hit areas are now anxiously awaiting a federal disaster declaration. And a big day for the Mountaineers as they survive in the Big East Tournament. News 8 Night Desk is next. Now, live from the state capitol, you're watching News 8 Night Desk. The floodwaters recede. Only now are some people seeing the extent of the devastation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Sue Jackson. And I'm Russ Riesinger. Thanks for joining us. It has been a very difficult week for thousands throughout our area. We've had nearly seven inches of rain since Friday, causing massive flooding. Officials estimate over 4,000 homes and over 350 businesses have been destroyed or damaged with $7 million in damage to roads. Now floodwaters in many areas are beginning to recede and residents are left with a cleanup. For people in the hardest hit areas of West Virginia, that federal disaster declaration won't come soon enough. In Mason County, the water is finally falling tonight and authorities are just now getting a look at how bad things really are. News 8's Matthew Hilk takes us there. Lucky cat! Come on, Lucky! Kitty, kitty. Just beyond the flood wall in Henderson, the waters recede to reveal the devastation. But they do not reveal one of the things that cannot be replaced. Candace Tucker's cat, Lucky. Lucky! The river has finally crested here, an unbelievable 10 feet above flood stage. But emergency officials say 1,500 people are still stranded due to high water and that about 150 homes have been damaged. They're just in shock, mostly. It was probably a good foot, foot and a half over the, over the porch. Tonight was the first time many returning residents were able to see that damage. Others never left. Sure stuck around. Woodson Austin is 83 years old, but he and his wife refused to leave even as the waters surrounded them. In there, everything floating around. Entire communities may be washed away, like here in Kingtown, where officials say there may be as many as 35 to 40 homes back there, severely damaged or destroyed. But people in Henderson are thankful that property was the only thing damaged, proving that even these rain clouds can have silver linings. This is my lucky cat. Matthew Hilk, News 8, Mason County. And Governor... West Virginia legislature stays, but now the West Virginia legislature will have to face the abortion debate as well. News 8's Matthew Hilk is live at the state capitol where a rally is now taking place. Matthew, what's happening right now? Well, Jack, as you can see behind me, the crowd for the noon rally on the north side of the Capitol has gathered already. Their focus today, a bill to be introduced this afternoon or tomorrow in the West Virginia Senate. That bill would do what Congress on Capitol Hill tried to do last year, ban the so-called partial birth abortions performed in the second and third trimester. The chances, though, still uncertain. We're joined live now by Wanda Franz, the president of the National Right to Life Committee. You are also a West Virginian, and you are back in West Virginia for this event. Tell me honestly your assessment of the chances of that kind of bill passing the West Virginia legislature. We think there's an excellent opportunity. Activists turned out in force to support the measure. News 8's Matthew Hilk is live at the state capitol. Matthew, what are the chances of this bill becoming law? Probably better than average. Turns out that most of the 34 state senators here have come forward wanting to co-sponsor that legislation. Today, a strong show of support from pro-lifers with a rally on the Capitol steps here. But pro-choice activists say this particular bill is unclear and unconstitutional. George Ed Brady stands out in the crowded debate over abortion. She may be one of the only people around who hasn't completely made up her mind. I'm more um, pro-choice than I am pro-life, but since I've become a parent, I thought I would, um, I'm trying to become more knowledgeable. But people at this rally say they have all the knowledge they need on the issue. If the partial birth abortion isn't the shedding of innocent blood, I don't know what is. Anderson is introducing a bill to ban so-called partial birth abortions. Anti-abortion activists had plenty to celebrate here. 24 of 34 state senators have signed up to co-sponsor that bill. The Senate bill would outlaw partial birth abortions except in cases where the mother's life is in danger. And it would not punish the mothers, but the doctors, with up to 10 years in prison and $10,000 in fines. 
Congress passed a similar ban last year. The president vetoed it, saying late-term abortions should be allowed when the mother's health is in danger. Local abortion rights supporters call this bill vague and unconstitutional. This bill proposes to restrict a woman's ability to get an abortion at any stage of pregnancy. There's no limitation in the bill as to when in the pregnancy it applies. So it's a bill to intimidate doctors from per performing the procedure. Summers County Senator Anderson will introduce that bill tomorrow. One top legislative source tells me that the chances of it making out of committee are very, very good, but it's very hard to tell how this bill will do. Lawmakers do not want to be pinned down on the abortion issue. I was chatting with one of them just a few minutes ago. I said, sooner or later, you're going to have to express your opinion on the issue, and his answer was, not necessarily. Mary Sue. Well, Matthew, of course, this similar legislation is the focus of much debate on Capitol Hill. Where does it stand right now in Congress? Well, of course, Congress could not override the president's veto last year. This week, there are hearings back before Congress on late-term abortions. There was testimony just yesterday from abortion providers who say that they view that this effort as an effort to eventually ban all abortions, Mary Sue. And once again, the partial birth abortion legislation to be introduced tomorrow in the state Senate. Our Matthew Hill reports. Most unusual, a U.S. post office. News aides Matthew Hilk is live at post office headquarters in Charleston. Matthew, you don't hear about post offices being robbed around here too often. No, Russ, you sure don't. And now postal officials here in Charleston are offering a reward in the case. And like many of us, they're wondering if this is in any way connected to that rash of robberies in the past 48 hours. Take a look at the scene in Malden this morning. Search dogs having no luck finding the man with the knife who walked into the contract post office in Malden. Took 700 bucks and locked a clerk in a section of the building. The man who owns that store there says nothing like this has ever happened in his 25 years in business there. I mean, it's a very trusting nice place you know you feel comfortable being here you don't feel comfortable with things like this happening you know they always say it's it's not a smart thing to go into a post office and, and commit any type of crime in a post office because then you get the federal authorities involved adjusted the past two days police believe that the same man had two other robberies at the dry cleaners and the super eight there in dunbar last night a man robbed this pizza joint in st albans now police on the scene mauled him this morning initially told us that they thought all the robberies may be connected. Later, police are telling us they believe a different man is responsible for the one in uh, the post office there. The suspect you see there on the screen, the description on the screen, they do believe that that is a different suspect from the robberies in Dunbar and perhaps in St. Albans. Again, Russ, police aren't sure if any or if all of these robberies are in any way connected, but certainly an awful lot of them in an awfully short period of time here, Russ. Yeah, there sure has been, and that's a big concern for a lot of folks. Thanks, Matthew Hilk, for that report. A uh, Charleston woman is facing... Is eight and six is next. Now, live from the state capitol, you're watching News 8 at 6. What happens when you rely on the computer and the computer crashes? The Knob County Sheriff's Department finds out the hard way. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Sue Jackson. Yeah, and I'm Russ Reesinger. Thanks for joining us. It is the worst nightmare for anyone whose work depends on that ever-important computer. But when it happens to a major government agency, a lot more is at stake. It turns out the computer system at the Kanawha County Sheriff's Department has been down for more than three months, leaving crime fighters with their hands tied. But a solution is on the horizon. News 8's Matthew Hilk is live in our Charleston newsroom with the exclusive story. Matthew, uh, now how big of a problem are they facing with this? Mary Sue, the sheriff calls it mind-boggling. His detectives call it a nightmare. Now, I know that here in our newsroom, if we lost our computers for just a day, we'd have some serious problems. So you can imagine what it's like fighting crime without one of these for three months. The problem. It was a physical hard drive crash. The result. Frustrating. Frustrating, a royal pain. Detectives like Ray Flint just can't do their job unless they can compare similar crimes, similar suspects, and similar methods. Normally, they do that like this. But in December, the law enforcement main hard drive crashed. Backups then malfunctioned. Sheriff David Tucker says some investigations have been compromised. And he says he doesn't know how much data has been lost permanently. There are some paper backups. And that won't even help yeah. you on that. But for now, road deputies and detectives can't check computers for things like criminal records, accident reports, 
and mugshot files. It's a mind-boggling. They've had to search or go back and do the old foot and leg type that they did back in the 20s and 30s. Now the county commission has approved $30,000 for software to fix the problem, but it can't be installed until May. Government has to realize what the private sector realized a long time ago. Computers don't last forever. Now, the Sheriff's Department was already in the process of upgrading its computer system to a network setup like this one here, so there shouldn't be this many problems in the future. Sheriff Tucker does say that there will be a better system of backups from now on, Mary Sue. But why is it taking so long to fix it? Well, officials there say it seems like a long time, but the Sheriff says he didn't even know about the problem until after he took office. And the officials there at the Sheriff's Department say from then on it was a matter of finding the company to fix the problem, going to the County Commission for money, scheduling time for that company to come in. So they say they've actually been going full speed to get this thing fixed, and the Sheriff says uh, he thanks the County Commission for their quick work on this, Mary Sue. Three months is an eternity without your computer. Thanks, Matt, for that exclusive report. If you're an American Electric Power customer, beware of two separate types of fraudulent activity in Kanawha County. Now, first, someone is going door to door trying to sell replacement. Police hope to catch the suspect in the rape of an elderly woman. It's all next on News 8 at 6. Now, live from the state capitol, you're watching News 8 at 6. Really big. That's how hospitals across the area describe the changes on the way in local health care after a major announcement. Good evening, everyone. I'm Russ Riesinger. And I'm Mary Sue Jackson. In the past years, few things have become more complicated, more expensive, and more different than the way you get health care. Those changes may leave many of our local hospitals fighting for their own lives. Now, tonight, word of an unprecedented agreement between most of the area's biggest hospitals. News 8's Matthew Hilk is live at Charleston Area Medical Center. Matthew, is this a merger? Well, not exactly. Executives call it the closest thing to being a merger without actually being a merger. Now, this hospital and four others are now studying the possibility of a business partnership. And they say that partnership should eventually make community hospitals like this one here cheaper and easier to use. Now, let's take a look at the five hospitals, the not-for-profit hospitals involved. CAMC, Cabell Huntington, St. Mary's, Pleasant Valley and Monongalia General. Now they are now studying ways to pool resources to share facilities and to trade notes on purchasing. Now it is a matter of survival for these hospitals against the for-profit operations in West Virginia owned by Columbia HCA. But the hospitals say for patients it's more than just business. Your records are available wherever you go to in the system. You don't have to go three places to get four different things done and have a separate bill coming for all of them. Now, how do you do more, better, for less? If you can, you survive. If you can't, you fail. And it's too important for us to have good, strong community hospitals. We can't permit them to fail because they didn't try. Now, it will take a while for the hospitals to work out the details in the study. That study will take about 16 weeks. It would take quite a much longer period of time to actually have state agencies approve this partnership, but the hospitals say they won't survive if they don't do something, and this is the best idea they have. Back to you. I know when other nonprofit hospitals have consolidated, it's meant some big layoffs. Uh, any word on how jobs might be affected here? The executives we talked to today at that announcement say that obviously when you look at sharing resources, some things will be slimmed down, others will be expanded, but they say ultimately this will put all these hospitals in better financial shape, so in less of a position to need to lay people off, Russ. All right, Matthew Hilk reporting live tonight from Charleston. Some of Charleston's west side. And today the city beefed up police presence there. News 8's Matthew oh. Hilk is live at the police department's new west side station. Matthew, will a building really make a difference? Well, Russ, police and neighborhood groups do say that just the very sight of this building here on this street will make people feel safer, will make criminals think twice about what they're doing here. Let's take a quick look inside this building. Now, police say this won't be a 24-hour manned facility, but it will be a regular base of operations for the five or six officers who are in the area at any one time. Police say the big problems here are disturbances, street-level drug traffic, and prostitution. To fight it, officers will use the district office to hear residents' complaints, to file reports, and to be there to respond more quickly to crimes. Now, some people along this street aren't sure this is the answer, but they are sure something has to be done. I had four or five big fights over on that store. Yeah, that guy worked right here. They shot him out there at that stop sign. A lot of dope pedals through here. They run through here all day long, all night. Seven days a week they run through here. And the best part of this whole deal, the price, a dollar a year lease from the business next door, BSH. In return, the city remodels this building, Russ. Matthew, are police saying anything about plans for some of the other high crime areas? 
Well, in fact, plans like this are already in place. Police do have a substation, a district office in the east end at Plaza East and on the south side in Kanawha City. Back to you. All right, Matthew Hilk reporting tonight from Charleston. Well, the warmer weather brings out the fun seekers, but it also brings out...